All right. Hello, 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 everyone. Hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our Fornes Feast. My name, I'm going to take this off for a second. My name is Joy Meads. I am the director of Dramaturgy and New Works here at American Conservatory Theater. Woo! Woo. We are here tonight to celebrate Marie Irene Fornes and the extraordinary impact of her life's work. Right now, we're running one of her masterpieces, Fafu and Her Friends at the Strand Theater just a few blocks away. But this is one of an extraordinary body of work. By my count, there's, she wrote 41 other plays and musicals. Um, her body of work, she uh, broke apart theatrical conventions. She inspired generations of artists and audiences to see the world anew, and she left a freer and more expansive theater in her wake. And her work as a playwright, a director, and a teacher of artists, it's impossible to overstate her impact on the art form as we know it. We are all inheritors of her artistic legacy. Whether you can quote from all her plays or whether you know, you're hearing her name for the first time now, you have been enriched by her life's work. We are here tonight to rejoice in that great inheritance. And I'm overjoyed to be joined by some of the most remarkable artists in the entire country, um, some of whom, whom knew Irene deeply, some of whom had a more glancing contact, but all of whom were transformed by her art and her artistic process. Um, because we're going to ground this evening in the breadth of her body of work, you're going to hear some, some of our artists are going to share some ex uh, sections of some of her other works. So consider this a kind of sampler platter of some of her plays. And, some of, and everybody's going to share um, some uh, remarks about um, personal testimonies to her impact on the field as a whole to the, and to them as artists. We're also going to hear one of her songs because this would not be a night honoring Irene Fornes without a little music. Um, so I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank this community who's gathered. I want to thank the amazing artists who are here, some of the best writers, some of the best humans in the whole damn country. So um, and I also want to thank um, Wendy Vanden Heuvel, whose generous support made this celebration possible. I, thank you, Wendy. Um, this is part of a weekend-long celebration that we're doing of Irene Fornes's um, life and legacy. I want to invite you all, tomorrow night, we're going to have a screening, a free screening, of the extraordinary documentary, The Rest I Make Up, by Michelle Memran. It's my favorite documentary I've ever seen. It's a beautiful, beautiful, she's captured Irene's spirit and her artistry so wonderfully in this work. So that's going to be at 5.30 at The Strand tomorrow. Free, 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 come join us for that. Um, and I want to I acknowledge, so we're acknowledging the ground on which we stand artistically, right, in the work of Irene Fornes. I also want to acknowledge the literal land that we're standing on, which is the unceded land of the Ramatush Ohlone people. And we are um, charged to be stewards of this land that they first inhabited. And one of the things that we're doing towards that end tonight is one thing that we're doing to care for the land is you'll see that our um, plates, our glasses are all compostable. So please make sure that you put those in the compost when you're done with them. Don't throw them away. Let's continue to um, steward the land that, um, that we have that was first and continues to be um, inhabited by the Ramatish Ohlone people. Finally, I want to thank La Casina Marketplace for hosting us tonight. This is such a gem of this neighborhood. It's a, um, a co-op, it's an event space. There are going to be a number of cultural events happening. We're going to have drag brunches and there's open mic nights. And I really encourage you to follow La Casina on social media to hear all of the incredible things that they're doing. Um, and also to visit them. They're open normally Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, there'll be different vendors here all of the time, and they're uniformly delicious. So <laughs> great. Um, so let's get started, y'all. Um, our first speaker here tonight is Migdalia Cruz, who is... Woo! 
an award-winning multi-platform playwright, translator, librettist, and lyricist. She's written over 60 plays. She's an incredible artist, and we are really lucky to have her here tonight. Magdalia, please. Scene four from Fornese's The Danube. In the garden, there are dried leaves. There is a cement pillar, the top of which is cut at a slant with a cloth sculpted over it. The word true is engraved on the base. The sound tape contains only the Hungarian phrases. And Eve says, <clears throat> this may be the last time I come here. Here is where I first kissed you. I kissed you that day, you know. I kissed you because I could not help myself. Now again, I try to exert control over myself, and I can't. I try to appear content, and I can't. I know I look distressed. I feel how my face quivers and my blood feels thin, and I can hardly breathe, and my skin feels dry. I have no power to show something other than what I feel. I am destroyed. And even if I try, my lips will not smile. Instead, I cling to you and make it harder for you. Leave now. Leave me here looking at the leaves. Goodbye. If I don't look at you, it may be that I can let you go. Paul kisses Eve. Music plays. Lights fade. As the scenery is changed, smoke goes up from the stage floor. On October 30th, 2018, in a nursing home on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, I imagined Irene's soul transitioning to the next life. I thought, we should open a window so her soul can escape into the wind rustling the autumn leaves as she moves one more time through the city she so loved. But mainly, I was filled with a solemn thankfulness for having known her, for having her be my mentor and tormentor, for teaching me how to tell an ugly story in a beautiful way. The Danube tells the story of war, devastation, destruction, and does it using the literal language of learning a foreign tongue. Language for Irene has always equaled culture. The construction and deconstruction of language is also how we fall in love, fall apart, and tell all our stories. On October 30th, 2018, I had no words. Through mourning my second mother, I learned that silence also tells a story. But now when I hear the wind in the trees, I rejoice in the gift she left me a life lived reveling in language, in language as insistent as the sound of a steady breeze blowing through the treetops. That's beautiful, thank you, Magdalia. Next, I'm going to be joined by Ann Washburn, who is an extraordinary playwright, been produced all around the nation and, in fact, the globe. I believe she just came back from Sweden, where there was a production of one of her plays. Um, ACT audiences may have seen her play, Mr. Burns, a post-electric play, which was at the Geary a few years ago. Ann, please come join us. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I, um Joy asked me uh, if I'd had any contact with Irene Fornes, I think when she was seeking to put together this evening. And I said yes, but what's important about my contact with Irene Fornes, unlike um, I mean, the ex kind of extraordinary lifelong um, bonds that you'll also hear about tonight, um, was that mine was not, uh, mine was not an important one. Um, I don't think she, I had many points of contact with her. She was enormously influential for me, enormously important for me. I don't think she ever knew my name. Um, I don't think I would strike any recollective bells with her, but I think in this way, um, perhaps I am typical of many, many American playwrights. So I'm about to sort of unleash some very sort of almost random 
discursive memories that I have of Irene, and then I'm going to finish up with the, the little sort of speech that I give to undergraduate or graduate students about how it is because of Irene Fornes that we are American playwrights, um, or how it is that Irene Fornes defines the way in which we are American playwrights. Um, so I first heard about Irene, I was in Seattle in 1990, and she was directing a production of Fefo and Friends at New City Theater. And a friend of mine, the playwright Brett Fetzer, was running the light board. And something about the setup of the, the light board at New City Theater, there was a moment, I think it's Julia's hallucination in the second act, where there was an eerie green light and an eerie sound. And the eerie green light was over here, and the eerie sound button was way on the other side of the booth. So as a, as a favor, I would come every evening and just for that period of time hit the <laughs> button at that one moment. And I had never heard of Irene Fornes, and I was sort of mesmerized by this crazy play. And my friend Brett, who was more in the know than I was, says, well, she's doing these playwriting workshops. We've got to, uh, we've got to take them. So I paid what seemed to me like an extraordinary amount of money to do four three-hour sessions with her in a row. And it was an hour of physical warm-up, uh, followed by a brief visualization of one of your characters, which was very hard for me because I don't visualize characters. And then she would utter two sort of random phrases like, has the bus come, or did you see him, or what's that thing over there? And you would write them down and you would pick one, and you would write for an hour very quickly. And then at the last hour would be sharing of work. And it was that pattern each of the four days. Irene was very stern, very unapproachable, very impressive. You really wanted to get her approval and you couldn't. It was great. Um, and from that, those four sessions, I got the starts of two plays, I later realized. So that was great. I was really thrilled with that. I loved seeing Fefu, some parts of it over and over, and some parts, you know, only hither and yon. I couldn't make sense of the play, honestly. I didn't really understand it, but I found it really compelling and weirdly haunting. Um, then, years later, I was at graduate school at NYU, where Magdalia Cruz and Irene Fornes co-taught a semester. Um, so I had a slightly different version of Irene. Um, I think that was toward the end of her teaching officially, yeah? That was one of the last, the last sort of sessions. Then I left graduate school and I was at loose ends and I wanted someone to make me write something that would be good. And so I was working as an office manager at the Flea Theater at the time and I, with a group of other playwrights, convinced them to let us have do playwriting workshops taught by playwrights who we would um, lure in, and the first person we thought of was Irene Fornes, and so she came in and taught that same four session intensive she had done. It was years later, it was a little, she was a little disconnected at that time, the memory loss was starting. She would repeat herself, everything she repeated was as brilliant as it had been the first time, it was actually kind of great to get a second go round. <laughs> um, she didn't remember names, and she was a little bit flaky about the way it was scheduled. But um, I got a play that I really love out of it, um, as did other people in the class. We asked her back the next year. That year was rocky. Um, she was really sort of losing control of the class. She really didn't remember names. There was more repetition. The structure was looser. So the third year, we thought, should we ask her back? And we did. And we, um, you know, we would put out word about the class. We'd always have fill up the class, and there'd be a huge wait list. So that year, once we had the class assembled, we reached out to everyone before they had paid any money and said, um, now this is what you need to know. Um, it's going to be a little rickety. It's going to be a little rocky. She will not remember your name. She will repeat herself. The class structure may slightly disintegrate. Um, you are welcome to, to not take the class at all. Um, this is not a problem. Um, but we want you to know that we have... Uh, we have brought her in any way because we think she is the most brilliant teacher of playwriting we have ever run into. It may be flaky, it may be strange, it will still be brilliant. And we think um, it's an enormous chance and probably the last chance to learn from her. Um, everyone stayed, no one dropped the class. And because everyone sort of knew what it was, it was the most beautiful class I've ever been part of. Everyone kind of treasured and held her. Um, she didn't show up the first day 
she had forgotten. So I ran and took a taxi and ferried her over and we realized at that point we needed to you know, pick her up and take her back. On the last day of the last class, I said, great, let's, I've got a taxi for you. And she said, oh, let's walk. It was sort of an hour and a half walk from the Flea Theater to the middle of the West Village and she sort of took my hand and again, she really didn't know who I was and just, we had the most amazing, charming talk. I mean, mostly she talked and the beautiful day and she was brilliant, 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 brilliant non-stop brilliant. Um, the one sort of privileged encounter I had is because I'm friends with Michelle. I wasn't involved in the filming of this documentary, but somehow because of that, I did end up dancing with Maria Irene Fornes in the back of a bar late one night. Um, that's the only uh, special thing I would say. Um, and then I, I so th these were sort of the ways in which one might have known her as an American playwright, sort of taking her classes um, by the by in various ways. But then the thing that I want to say, um, the thing that I say to students is that because her method of teaching, which I think is going to be um, described more intensively by people who really spent serious time with her, is that uh, she really, you know, she came to New York and she was a visual person and she came into a, the downtown theater world, which was exper you know, a place of experiment. It was where visual artists were coming together with musicians, were coming together with poets, were coming together with theater people. And so what was being made was this weirdo conglomeration of all of those things. And what she really, um, she both took from it and she brought, uh, brought to it um, was this deep, uh, her method is one of deep intuition and, um, and, and really sort of following the, the deepest wellsprings that you have. And if you, um, and that was intrinsic to how she taught, it was intrinsic to how you received her teaching, it was intrinsic to the kind of work you made underneath her and inspired by her. And really from that point on to some degree or another. And um, it is that sort of deep, love and trust of, of the intuitive. It's the sort of multiplicitous influence that was just intrinsic to how she thought about theater, um, which is really particular to uh, the American theater of downtown in the 50s and 60s. But because Irene was such a compelling, brilliant, and prolific teacher, any American playwright um, going has either been taught by Irene Fornes or is to been taught by someone who was taught by Irene Fornes, or at this point has been taught by someone who was taught by someone who was taught by Irene Fornes. It is the most pervasive way of thinking about making a theater, um, I, I think, anywhere. And, and to a degree we don't ever quite realize this is what really has, um, it's the underlying wellspring of the kind of weird, glorious, crazy, um, particularity of American playwriting, and especially American playwriting now. So that was what I wanted to say. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, and next up we have Jorge Ignacio Cortinas, um, who is an extraordinary playwright. He got his start right here in San Francisco, a first play produced by Sean San Jose and has gone on to be produced all over the country at the Whitney Museum, at the Humana Festival of New American Plays. Um, a wonderful writer who I first met, he's a usual suspect at New York Theater Workshop, so I got to meet him there. Um, and just so gratified to have him here today. Thanks so much, Jorge, come on up. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to read a short little excerpt from Enter the Night, which I hope the playwrights in the room, and maybe all the artists in the room can relate to. Um, <clears throat> there's three characters, Paula, Jack, and Tressa. And um, Jack has been missing for a while. He resurfaces, and in the interim, has written a play. Um, he wants his friend Paula to read it. Paula can't read it right that moment. She exits left. Jack throws himself on the floor and has a tantrum. He bangs on the floor with fists and feet. She doesn't want to read it. She doesn't want to read it. Off. You don't want to read it. 
No one wants to read my play. No one wants to read my play. No one wants to read my play. <laughs> he calls after Paula in the next room. How long are you going to take? Please don't take long. Paula in the bathroom. Jack. Jack. Five minutes? Three minutes? Half an hour? Paula. Jack. Jack. Ten minutes? Paula. Go away, Jack. He goes and he sits in front of Tressa. Would you read it? Tressa takes the script and starts to read. Jack sits on the floor to watch her read. Jack, Paula, Tressa's reading it. He looks at Tressa for signs. He walks away, turns to look at her from a different angle, circles her, lies down with his head propped up on his hand. She smiles. Paula, she's smiling. Tressa is still reading. He watches her. She laughs. He contracts with a tremor of pleasure. He watches a while longer. She smiles again, then laughs. Paula, she's laughing. Paula from off. Good. A moment passes. Tressa turns the page. She reads. Paula, she's still reading. It must be good. Paula, is it good, Tressa? Tressa. Uh-huh. Paula, can you tell yet? Tressa, it's good. Paula, what's it about? Tressa, compote. <laughs> I love this scene so much, and it tells you so much about Fornes. It is deceptively simple. Paula is off stage. And there's something about characters calling to each other across the expanse of the stage that animates the space. It feels like in that moment, she takes the space between the characters and she makes it live. Watching someone read on stage is probably on a list of things playwrights shouldn't stage. Uh, it's probably inherently not so interesting. It seems like that's really the province of novelists because it has to do with interiority. But Fornes has us watch Jack watching Tressa read, and then Jack narrates his ex uh, experience of watching her read, and her reactions suddenly also become animated and alive. And there's something about these two strategies that Fornes uses that demonstrates her talent for making visible the invisible. We've all noticed, I'm sure, that our living spaces become more beautiful when our friends are in them. And I don't just mean seem more beautiful, sound more beautiful, I mean literally become more beautiful. We see this as well, obviously, in, in Fefu, a play about a group of friends getting together in a country house. Fornes once told me something interesting. She said, in a naturalistic play, it is the characters who are alive. And in a contemporary play, it is the play itself that is alive. And I thought, oh, that is the most perfect summation of the ambiance of a Fornes play. And then there's also her affinity and her interest in wonder. A character that, like Jack, who has such uninterrupted access to his own id, uh, we watch him and we get to experience the same wonder that Fornes felt when she stood before art, creating it, sure, but also consuming it. And somehow that scene is also a scene of instruction. She's teaching us how to experience theater. She wants us to let go of our adult expectations and our American, North American impulse to make everything useful and just delight in the strange and idiosyncratic life form breathing and living in front of us. And that life form, again, is not just the characters, it's the entirety of the play, the space between Jack and Paula as he cries out, cries out to her from across the stage, and it's that space between Paula, uh, sorry, Jack and Tressa as he watches her read his play. There's this fantastic story. Um, we were just talking about watching the production of Mud in New York. 
uh, when the signature did its season-long exploration of Fornes's work, and they forced uh, Fornes to come in and do one of these question and answer periods with the audience, and um, somebody raised his hand and said, can you tell me where the play takes place? Because it famously doesn't say in the stage directions. And Fornes looked at him and very patiently said, are you, do you mean that you want to know the address of the house? <laughs> and the man resisted her a little more and, and really wanted to know what the play meant, which was maybe Fornes's least favorite question. To her, it was evidence, if you were asking that question, that you hadn't experienced the play. And uh, finally, she said, you know, my, my advice to you is relax. <laughs> and when it was, it was she, she had this way of saying it that, you know, that sounds like a shady comment and uh, probably on some level it is, but uh, she had a way of saying it that was also incredibly disarming. And I feel like this relaxing is actually the first step to experiencing wonder, right? To relax and to surrender to the work of art in front of us. Um, for some reason, I, I think it's harder for people to do this with theater than it is with other art forms. And I often tell people, students or uh, audience members at these question and answer periods, that we actually have models for this that we experience all the time from other genres. And one of the genres that we, I think, have less trouble relaxing in front of is music. Uh, so I'm especially happy that I got to speak before a song, but I'm going to let Joy introduce the song. Thank you, Jorge. Okay, so we are going to hear a song from, it's a cigarette song from Maria Irene Fornes' great musical Promenade. She wrote the lyrics. The um, music is by Al Carmine, and it is going to be performed for us tonight by the great Selena Hark Harkness Lee will be our singer, accompanied by Thaddeus Pinkston. Thank you so much. So I have just discovered what life is all about. To walk down the street with a mean look on my face, a cigarette in the right hand and a toothpick in the left. To alternate between the cigarette and the toothpick, ah, that's life. To alternate between the cigarette and the toothpick, Ah, uh, that's life. Yes, I have learned from life. Every day I've learned some more. Every blow has been of use. Every joy has been a lesson. Yes, I have learned from life. What surprises me is that life has not learned from me. No? You still don't understand? I'm placid as a cow, as lucid as glass, as frank as a bald head, as faithful as a dog. To walk down the street with a mean look on my face, a cigarette in the right hand and a toothpick in the left. To alternate between the cigarette and the toothpick. Ah, that's life. Yes, I have learned from life. Every day I've learned some more. Every blow has been of use. Every joy has been a lesson. Yes, yes, life has not learned from me. Yet. Thank you.
Thank you, Selena and Thaddeus. I love that yet. That's wonderful. Um, so next up, I'm going to introduce uh, the great Naomi Azuka, a wonderful playwright. Her plays include 36 Views, Aloha Say the Pretty Girls, Polaroid Stories, many, many, many more. Um, it's an honor to have her here with us today. Thank you so much. It's so great to be in community with all of you celebrating Fornes. I think she is a titan. And when Joy asked me to say a few words about Maria Irene Fornes, that was actually one of the first things that came to my mind. She is one of the titans. She's one of the greats. Um, I, I had some adjectives, too. I, I think of her as she's visionary. She's, oh, can you hear me now? Sorry about that. Um, I, she is visionary. She was fearless. She was rigorous and playful, and she was completely sui generis. And I think that's a really, really important um, element of who she was. Um, I think I, I, I had, like uh, you know, Anne, a sort of glancing relationship with uh, Fornes. I was fortunate enough to be her student in a workshop that actually Luis was also in. And I, I thought I might share with you that experience because I think it gives you a sense of who Fornes was and the impact that she had on American theater. And I do, I agree also with you, Anne, that I think pretty much every playwright writing today has either been her student you know, or has or is, or is learned from somebody who was her student or student student. I mean, honestly, it's, it's extraordinary, her, the scope of her influence. Um, so this, this workshop, um, we were all um, emerging writers. We were all, I think, um, really learning our craft and not quite knowing our way yet. And in fact, in some instances, I think still discovering our voices. And um, Fornes was, um, she was somewhat intimidating, but also had this presence that made you you just instantly knew that she had wisdom. And if you could be humble and if you could be patient, she, you, would, you, would, you would get some wisdom. And, and that was um, really tantalizing. So I, I came into that workshop as somebody who um, I think is much more in my mind, much more um, analytical, and th the opposite, actually, of what Fornes is so was so brilliant, uh, you know, uh, with she, you know, for somebody like me who thinks of plays, at least at that time, not anymore, you know, as a kind of um, a thing that you build, you know, assiduously with, and you, and, and you make it work and it's, it's a puzzle and it's, and I still have a little bit of that, but I credit Fornes with being the first and most influential person to disabuse me of that metaphor of the play as, a, as an engine or, or a clock. Um, I learned a lot of things in that, in, in that workshop. The, the, the first was her approach to process, which some of you alluded to. Um, I had always thought of, of because I'm, I think I'm, I'm a sort of a logical person, as a, a play is something that you, you, you have a beginning, you have an idea, you research, you, you know, and, and she completely upended that idea of how you, you write a play in, in, in a way that was, um, f for me, who was rather sheltered at the time and very bookish, mind-blowing. It was about being in your body. It was experiential. Um, and I think the thing that I realized, and I, I intuited it at the time, but I have really come to value it over the decades since, is it, it's what makes a play great, what gives play a play life is precisely what Fornes teaches you to do as a playwright, that it is this kind of intuitive and also associative way of getting to whatever that juice is, whatever that pilot light is that makes a play go. Um, so her approach was, was revelatory, this idea that there was a kind of wild, unconscious mind that if you could trust enough to open the windows and doors to let in, you would be rewarded. The second thing I, I, I learned from Fornes was to really listen to the music 
of the piece, and I mean that in a, in a more sort of figurative sense, that each play has a kind of metabolism, a kind of a rhythm or beat. Um, I know Morgan Jeunesse, who is a, 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 a very old friend of, 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 of Fournaise, also spoke about this, that it's, it's a piece of, a play is much more like a piece of music than it is like a novel. Um, and that I, I take with me at the time, and even now, much later, I don't always understand how to, to get there, but I know that if the play is to live, it has to get there. Um, the other thing, the third thing that I really, um, that, that I take from that, that workshop with Fornes is this way of getting to character. I remember that she had us draw uh, portraits of of the characters, and for somebody like me who was not a particularly visual person or an artist, I found this incredibly difficult. But I actually think that, and it's it's something that I, I've since done with my students. It's something that gets to the part of your brain that I that you want to get to as a playwright when you're when you're creating character. Um, it is not it is not about some sort of internal life. It's not logical. It's not about a backstory. It's about your it's about your seeing something emerge in bits and pieces in the darkness. And so that act of actually drawing a character that you didn't know yet um, was just an incredible gift. Um, the final thing that I, I, I think I, I took from the workshop is this idea that a play is an ecosystem and a world. I think that um, for you know we, we talk a lot. I, I, I do a fair amount of TV work now, and people talk about world building, and they have a very sort of specific idea when they say that. But whenever anybody talks about world building, I think about Fornes, which is like a, such a strange because people talk about that with you know sci-fi and genre, but Fornes, her plays were these self-contained extraordinary worlds they each each one each one different each one having different sorts of landscapes and sort of rules of engagement um, different kinds of atmospheric pressures and I think um, I think thinking about a play in that way was something that just opened up my eyes the 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 final thing that I will say which I didn't really didn't realize at the time was that Fornes I think inspired me to be a teacher. Fornes and a, another writer named Sherry Kramer, who is a little bit younger, who I adore, um, and I and I have I mean even this last week it's so strange because I had this one workshop with Fornes last week I told a playwright to go look up Conduct of Life because of something that she was working on. I cannot tell you how many students that I now have taught over the years and. All of them, I sort of feel like I've in some way been fortunate enough to have Irene's DNA somehow inside of what I'm doing. And now all of these writers who are out in the world, writers like Lauren Yee and, you know, just wonderful writers, Dave Harris, you know, Vivian Barnes, writers that if you don't know, you should know, have all been touched by Fornes. So thank you for letting me talk and thank you for inviting me to think about Irene. Thank you, Naomi. Up next up, we have Luis Alfaro, who is a MacArthur Genius Award winner. Gotta say that, right? Also, just a tremendous playwright, writer of Mojada, Oedipus El Rey, um, St. Jude, some of my favorite plays, and, um, and many, many others. So thank you so much, Luis. Come on up. Um, I was, uh, I was thinking as you were talking that, did something break? No. Oh, <laughs> I'm having one of those days. I was thinking, okay, great. Um, I, I was, uh, as I was getting ready to do this, uh, I wrote it down on my computer and then when we were walking over, McDonald said, why didn't you throw it in your phone? And I started to think, oh my God, I am of the generation that, uh, still has it on my computer, so. Forgive me for still having it on my computer and not on my phone. Um, the other thing I will say is that um, it is really, really moving to be here with these writers that I came up in the world with. 
So Jorge, we were talking about how I saw Maleta Mulata a million years ago, and Naomi in that first workshop, and Marga in our journey. So it's just really beautiful to be here. So um, let me just uh, tell you my recollection. If I remember correctly, there was some of this. <laughs> and then there was uh, some of this. <laughs> and more of this. And then letting the jaw relax. <laughs> and by the time you got to this, you were most definitely going to get to this moment. This was writing without a pen, the act of dreaming something forward, creating the space for the work to happen. In other words, the process of letting go. I would arrive, Luis Alfaro of the good idea, and then the other me would show up, Luis Alfaro, translator, interpreter, channeler of the world around me, two very different ways of working. I was one of those lucky many who got to study with Maria, Maria Irene Fernandez or Irene Fornes or La Maestra, and it changed my life. The room was almost religious at times. Listening to thoughts from Irene on approach, the surprise of writing, a journey into the unknown, and the exploration of one's own surprising id. A little bit of yoga, some visualizations, writing with prompts, and then reading. Never less than three hours but always felt too short. Irene was intuition. Her ability sparked something in you, running away from good ideas towards authentic and surprising ones that were more enduring. Someone has entered the room. Do you recognize this person? Often I wanted to scream out, yes, it's me, let's move on, right? <laughs> A good deal of the Fornes workshop was spent on getting out of the way of one's own work. I can still hear Irene's urging after a prompting question. Don't choose. The first idea that hits you is the best. When I see her now, I can picture her in a trademark look. Black slacks or skirt, a white blouse tucked in at the waist. She would pull out for the yoga stretches, the ritual of watching her roll up her sleeves, the literal and metaphorical action. Sometimes she wore a beret. It was the outfit to come into the room with to do the work. In 1999, we saw each other in New York at the Signature Theater during a retrospective season that included a last new play, Letters from Cuba. I knew I had to get myself into New York for this culminative moment. And I don't think I saw a finer production for me of Mud, anchored with the extraordinary performance by a frequent foreign S collaborator, the, the, the extraordinary Deidre O'Connell, who gave such a powerful performance. It was a very special evening, and Irene was beaming at the attention. I remember when she entered the room anchored on someone's arm and smiling with anticipation as she found a seat. She sat wrapped in the audience, listening and interrupting to speak when someone stumbled on a fact. It was her night. She was going to interrupt if she pleased. When I last worked and studied with Irene, the ravages of Alzheimer's were beginning. She had already become very forgetful. In 2003, I brought Irene out to Los Angeles for a powerful gathering of Latinx theater artists, a conference and community building event that culminated in a workshop led by La Maestra. We broke bread, we listened to new work, we had panels. I rented a van and put everyone up at a hotel in Pasadena, about a half hour from downtown Los Angeles. The morning of Irene's workshop, I was woken up by a call from the hotel telling me that she had checked out of her room. A panic set in me. And maybe I knew then that this was gonna be one of the last times our dear mentor would travel or teach. I raced over to Pasadena, maneuvering the curves of the oldest freeway in the state in the van. Irene was nowhere to be found. I was afraid to tell anyone for the panic that might set in. I ran around the hotel like a madman. I felt ridiculous, out of breath and in tears. Finally, I found her outside, standing next to the pool, her suitcase at her side, fully dressed, her little hat on and wearing her New York coat. She looked like a Magritte painting. I steeled myself not to alarm her. I approached and took her hand, and she asked me if we were in Cuba. She asked with such innocence and charm it calmed me. I could never tell how conscious she was about losing memory. I calmly told her we were in Pasadena, 
and that we were going to be giving a writer's workshop in a few hours, and I was wondering if she felt up for it. She looked at me surprised and said, of course. I told her we needed to check into the hotel. She was very calm and spoke in her Irenism. Very well, very well. We got back into the room and she said, oh my goodness, I recently stayed in a room just like this one. <laughs> I didn't have the heart to tell her it was in fact the same room. She gave a marvelous workshop. I think everyone in there had some special relationship with Irene. She looked at the room and it seemed like everyone represented a different moment in her life as a teacher. She began with some thoughts about writing and they were astute as always. I had not thought about the profundity of Irene's effect on my life and art. This tremendously talented writer with a process that could unleash wonderful creativity in original writing, who sat patiently in the room while we wrote furiously. Sometimes I would look up at Irene, my second mother, and I would make eye contact and she would look at you as sister say, you can do it, don't stop. Like many artists of my generation, we came into our own through our infamous workshops. The debt that was being paid and dedication was evident. In the silence, Irene created the environment for a world of possibility. She conjured wherever she went. The next morning, we got to the airport, and Eduardo Machado and Jorge Ignacio Cortinas had arranged to place Irene between them on the plane on the way back to New York. In that last drive to the airport, I could see myself on that first day of the workshop when we first met. In the room with other important Los Angeles writers like Leon Martel, Alice Twan, Bridget Carpenter, Cheryl Lynn Lee, rest in peace, Han Ong, Lynn Manning, rest in peace, and Naomi Izuka, among others. In 1999, we saw each other in New York, right? At the show. And I remember that as I was listening to the play Mud, I was feeling that I was being instructed into how characters reveal themselves like May does. We never said grace in this house. My father never did and I never learned how and neither did Lloyd. Lloyd, did you hear that? Henry said grace. I feel grace in my heart. I feel fresh inside as if a, a breeze had just gone inside my heart. What was it you said, Henry? What were those words? I don't retain the words, I never do. I find it hard to retain words I learn. It is hard for me to do the work at school. I can work on my feet all day at the ironing board. I can make myself do it even if I'm tired, but I cannot make myself retain what I learn. I have no memory. The teacher says I have no memory, and it's true, I don't. I don't remember the things I learned too well, not enough to pass the test. But I rejoice with the knowledge that I get. Not everything, but most things make me feel joyful. Do you feel that way, Henry? Like the starfish. I live in the dark and my eyes only see a faint light. It is faint and yet it consumes me. I long for it. I thirst for it. I would die for it. Lloyd, I am dying. Thank you, Luis. And next, I'd like to introduce Lisa Ramirez. Lisa, who is an actress and a playwright and a producer and who has been lucky enough to work with Irene Fornes in all three capacities. And as a true woman of the theater, booked it here from a matinee performance of Water by the Spoonful at San Francisco Playhouse. So thank you so much for joining us, Lisa. Come on up. Oh my God, you guys, this table is like the, the royal table. It's so beautiful. I, be, I have a, rela a great relationship with, Luis is conjuring Irene Fornes every other Saturday in the group that I've been involved in at CTG, which is the first uh, all women group of playwrights. Uh, and, and, and Irene is always with us, Naomi, is one of the first playwrights I ever met that actually, you actually taught me how to make soup. 
which I make all the time now. It's the best thing to do when you're writing. Migdalia, I've worshipped her plays since I first read, uh, um, um, now I'm thinking, uh, Miriam's Flowers, or is it, uh, and then for, and Jorge, I was in the world premiere of Maleta Mulata, and Anne, we did a silent retreat together, and I just, I, I don't know, it's like, anyway, I'm not trying to like say, I know everybody here, but I just like, <laughs> and, and I see Marga, and like all, like, and Michelle! But uh, the first time that I uh, met uh, Irene, I was the literary director at Brava for Women in the Arts uh, for a couple years, and um, I was cu uh, curating a reading series, and we brought Irene out to, um, she was working on last summer at Goss and Sauce, and at th that time I was drinking and it was still working for me, but I don't, I don't anymore. But we, we ended up getting into this huge argument about Hedda Gobbler, and um, she was like, Hedda Gobbler is agoraphobic, and, 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 and I, I had just seen Fiona Shaw's Hedda Gobbler, and I like worship Fiona Shaw, and um, she was oh, so disgusted by Fiona Shaw because she was like really believed that Hedda Gobbler was agoraphobic. And, and there was this whole connection actually between Fefu and Hedda Gobbler. I believe that, I believe that uh, Fefu is Irene's Hedda Gobbler. Um, anyway, we got into this great drunken argument. And then what happened was, I, at the time I wasn't writing, I was like maybe secretly writing like random poems about birds or whatever, but anyway, I took a workshop because someone dropped out of the workshop and Ellen Gavin said, uh, oh, there's, a, there's an opening, do you wanna take Irene's workshop? And I was like, oh, okay, I'm like, oh, okay. And I took the workshop and um, that was kind of like the, the seed was planted as far as like you can write because she actually did make it accessible. One of the things she said was that writing is like daydreaming on the page. And I was like, okay, well I could do that. Like I'm a really good daydreamer so I could just do it on the page. And then later I did a production of The Conduct of Life. Um, I played Leticia in Los Angeles um, and um, Donna Guevara Hill directed it and I just found out this morning that she passed a year ago, actually, yeah, in, in April and um, I found that out this morning and Irene came out and worked on it with us and so I'm gonna read a little bit um, about Irene, and I'm gonna do it in a very Irene way, and I'm trying to, I have kind of an Irene outfit on right now. <laughs> so she came in and, um, you know, like you say, the computer is old. <laughs> this is how Irene came in. Cause she liked, she, she decided that she was gonna rewrite the ending, even though she had written Conduct of Life. So she came in and she was like, <laughs> she had these, she would come in with these pages and pages, and even, even when we did last summer at Gus and Saw, she would come in with, and she, she'd go like, you know, like, and everybody would be like, oh no, because she never stopped writing. And as a result, probably all of us have never stopped writing. Like whenever we revisit a play, hopefully that's the case. But, um, so that was like my little Irene <laughs> shtick. Um, so this is a beautiful story about writing, and the thing about, I feel about Irene is that, is that anybody can write, that we all have stories, we all come from generations of storytellers. But she was also very practical, and um, there was a, there's a speech in scene 15, and um, it's, it's ne uh, Nena, and um, she told me that she was stuck on the conduct of life, and she had this big box of um, discarded writing, thing, like lines that she had discarded, or like, and uh, or monologues. And she literally said she stuck her hand into the box, like a raffle, you know, and like rummaged around, pulled this out, and this monologue, she placed in the in the area of the play that she was having trouble with. And then she said, then the rest of the play wrote itself. So I thought that was beautiful. So I'm just gonna read um, the monologue um, from The Conduct of Life, scene 15. Olympia and Nena are sitting at the dining room table. They are separating stones and other matter from dry beans. I used to clean beans when I was in the home and also string beans. I also pressed clothes. The days were long. Some girls did hand sewing. They spent the day doing that. 
I didn't like it. When I did that, the day was even longer and there were times when I couldn't move even if I tried. And they said I couldn't go there anymore, that I had to stay in the yard. I didn't mind sitting in the yard, looking at the birds. I went to the laundry room and watched the women work. They let me go in and sit there and they showed me how to press. I like to press because my mind wanders and I find satisfaction. I can iron all day. I like the way the wrinkles come out and things look nice. It's a miracle, isn't it? I could earn a living pressing clothes and I could find my grandpa and take care of him. So when um, I was writing this passage this morning, I realized that Irene, because I wrote it out, hand, hand wrote it, that Irene was like the women who ironed, that we've all been watching, and that she let us watch, like she let us into her, her mind and her creativity and her, her subconscious. And uh, so she was like the women who, who watched we watched her iron, and she taught us all how to iron, which I think was, was really beautiful. And I was going to say one other thing, and now I'm forgetting because I'm on the iron thing. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, did, I did actually tell her at the, there was an NYU celebration for her. Oh, this is what I wanted to say. Um, the person who's not here today, who also we're all connected to, is Morgan Jeunesse. And... Um, Morgan was Irene's agent, and I dealt with her when I was a literary agent at Brava, and then I dealt with her as a, uh, as a writer. She was my agent. She was a lot of our agents. And um, she gave me a brooch uh, last year, uh, one of Irene's brooches, and I, I tried to find it today, but all my stuff is in storage. <laughs> so I, I couldn't find it. But I just wanted to honor Morgan Jeunesse also because she's such a connector. That's where I met Naomi and Luis and... Um, I mentioned all of your names, and she was going to text me something to say, but she didn't, so I wasn't going to, like, hound her. But um, I'm just really, really honored to be amongst you guys. are some of my favorite playwrights and thinkers, and um, I, I'm just really honored to be here. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, I was just thinking, I never got to meet Maria Irene Fornes. I, I met her through her work. I first read Fefu and Her Friends when I was a waitress. And, you know, um, and it was a great play to read because it gave me a lot to think of when I was doing my side work, you know. Um, and I've been obsessed with her work for, you know, 20 years. I never got to meet her. But I, I, um, I love her plays, and I know her through her plays. And I also know her through every one of the writers that you heard speak today has written multiple plays that have moved me deeply, that have seared themselves on my mind, that I think of in times of pain and sorrow or, or, or when I, that come up, make me laugh at random times. There's a, a body of work that was created and it's incredibly moving to me to think about how Irene lives on. She lives on through her work, which is immortal, but she also lives on through her the other artists she inspired and who she um, unleashed in this beautiful way into the world. Um, again, we are all inheritors of her, of her work and her legacy. And what a beautiful, beautiful testament to all of it today. Thank you so much, artists. Thank you so much, guests, everyone. Um, thank you to Wendy Vanden Heuvel, whose generous support made all of this possible. Thank you, yes, Wendy. Um, thank you to Michelle Memran for her beautiful documentary, The Rest I Make Up. I wanna encourage you again, tomorrow night, we're gonna be screening that at the Strand Theater, 5.30 p.m. We'll have a Q&A with um, Michelle afterwards, so please, please come. And right now, what I hope you all will do is stay, have some food, have, get some drinks. We've got beer and wine over there. We've got agua frescas. Um, and enjoy yourselves. And let's all celebrate together that we were graced with this incredible artist who enriched us all. Thank you very much. Yeah.